quote, During the first part of the cycle, the flies will mate and lay eggs. During the second part of the cycle, larvae will hatch from the eggs and feed on the dead tissue. The larvae then transform into pupae during the third stage, and in the fourth and final stage, adult flies emerge from the pupae. The rate of insect development depends on the species, the microhabitat, and the temperature. The warmer the temperature, the faster the rate of development. When insect specimens are collected from a dead body at a crime scene, ideally they are divided into two samples. Some are placed in isopropyl alcohol to preserve them at that particular stage. Others are kept alive with something upon which to feed for the purpose of species identification. Since insect species development rates are published from controlled environmental studies, the first step is to identify those particular species involved." End quote. This week, we find out how the stages of fly development put one man on death row. We learn that sometimes even the smallest, most annoying, and even disgusting of creatures can provide everything needed to make sure that a murderer never walks the streets ever again. This week, we learn about the crimes of Howard Hawk Willis. I'm Chase Ellerman, and this is Almost Fiction. Chapter 1. 2002. Adam Chrismer was a generic, everyday high school student. At 17, he was just one of many who went to school every day, walked the halls without incident or fanfare of any kind, just a normal kid doing his best to try to fit in. Though usually more reserved while at school, at home, where he was the youngest of four, Adam came out of his shell, often getting laughs from his siblings when he would do his famous impressions of Jim Carrey and Elvis Presley. Adam also had a deep love of the outdoors, spending many an afternoon just wandering around Lookout Mountain, an area that was just over the state line from where he lived in Chickamauga, Georgia. Adam was just living a generic everyday life, until, that is, he met Samantha. Samantha Foster Lemming was just a year younger than Adam, and the pair had been dating since about the 10th grade. She was everything to him. And although he was still young, and although his family was against it, Adam wanted to marry Samantha. He just couldn't understand why nobody would support him in his most recent decision. His mother and stepfather weren't exactly thrilled when he had told them that he wanted to drop out of high school, but they at least had supported him in his decision, even if begrudgingly. He just wished they would support him in this. But after many talks, most of which escalated into full-scale arguments, it was clear that they just weren't willing to budge. So, searching for support, Adam and Samantha would eventually find what they were looking for in one of their friend's parents, a man named Howard Hawk Willis. Finally, an adult who was on their side. Howard Hawk Willis was a 51-year-old man and the father of Kelly Willis, a girl who had been a mutual friend of both Samantha and Adam. For whatever reason, he had taken a special interest in the young couple, and when he had heard their parents weren't willing to sign the paperwork for them to get married, he decided to help them come up with a plan. As he schemed with the underage teens, the small, strange group began to spend more and more time together, eventually getting to the point where both Adam and Samantha's family began to become more than a little worried. And the truth is, they should have been, especially if they knew anything about the plan. Howard had figured out that according to Georgia law, there was a loophole in which minors could marry each other without their parents' consent if the girl was pregnant. At the time, though, Samantha was not pregnant and had no plans on becoming pregnant, so instead, on the advice of Howard, Samantha made an appointment with a doctor to have a pregnancy test performed. Then, right before her appointment, Samantha approached a friend of hers who was at the time pregnant and obtained from her a bottle of urine. 
Samantha then took that urine to the doctor's office where she passed it off as her own, and just like she knew it would, the results showed positive for pregnancy. Now, with doctor's note in hand, the young couple had everything they needed to tie the knot, which they did on a hot August afternoon at the Walker County Courthouse in Lafayette, Georgia. Howard Hawk Willis was with them. Chapter 2 1999 Three Years Earlier Before he met Adam Krismer and Samantha Lemming, Howard Hawk Willis was a nondescript member of society. He was on his second marriage, his first wife, at least according to him, had left him one day after she took $900 from their savings and told him that she was going to the grocery store. She never came back. Apparently, Howard hadn't yet learned his lesson, as his newest marriage was now seemingly heading down the same path as his first one. Maybe it was his personality, or maybe it was the long hours spent away from home at his job as a long-haul trucker, but either way, things weren't looking so good for Howard and his wife. Then, almost overnight, everything in Howard's life changed, and not for the better. There are people who live on the edge of society, people who make their living by facilitating things. They are the kind of people you go to when you need something that is hard to find or maybe even illegal. Kenneth Hart Adams was one of these people, someone who could get you drugs to fall asleep, keep you awake, or put you somewhere in between. Kenneth was known to frequent truck stops, especially in the New Jersey area, where he provided his service as a facilitator. This is where he met Howard, who was just finishing a run before returning home. Kenneth had a deal, and he was looking for just the right driver, someone who was interested in making a lot of money. He was also looking for someone who would be willing to drive a load of limes from South Texas all the way back to Brooklyn, New York. He then went on to say that the load of limes was just a cover for the load of cocaine that was the real price. And as long as he kept his mouth shut and didn't get pulled over, Howard could expect to receive $90,000 for his little bit of work. And to show him that he meant business, Howard received $20,000 as a show of good faith. On October 16, 1999, Howard picked up the load and two days later, he pulled into the arranged spot by a warehouse in Brooklyn. Howard waited and waited for someone to come and take the shipment off his hands, but nobody showed up. Now nervous, Howard called the number for the contact in Brooklyn, but there was no answer. He tried again with no luck. For three days, Howard waited, sleeping in the cab of his truck, only a few feet away from the 786 kilos of cocaine and several tons of limes that were concealing the drug. Then finally, on October 21st, Howard's cell phone rang. Howard then received orders to leave where he currently was and drive to the New Jersey Turnpike to the Vince Lombardi service area, a location known to truckers and authorities alike as an area where many drug deals took place. Upon his arrival, Howard met with a man who took the keys to his truck before putting Howard up in a local motel. He was then told that someone would be in contact with him soon. Howard sat by the hotel room phone, but it never rang. Turns out the reason why Howard was never contacted was because his contact, the one who had come and picked up his truck, had parked the truck too close to a loading dock at a Bronx warehouse. The owners of the warehouse then complained to police that a mysterious truck was impeding their work and officers began to investigate, eventually calling in the New York City Drug Task Force. So, while Howard waited in his Meadowlands motel room for a call that was never going to come, Investigators began to look into the truck's owner, eventually getting a hold of Howard's wife, Wilda. When questioned, Wilda Willis told officers that all she knew about the truck was that it had a ton of limes and that she was worried about maybe losing the load to rot if nothing was done about it soon. Working with this concern, officers then get Wilda to give them permission to open the truck. Inside the trailer, officers discover 27 pallets of limes along with 656 bricks of cocaine.
Wilda then calls Howard and informs him of the situation surrounding his latest trip, as well as the fact that she gave permission for the truck to be searched. On October 23, 1999, Howard ran. First, he took a train home where he stayed for a day or two before getting on a plane and returning to New Jersey. He was arrested as he deboarded the plane in the Newark airport. He went quietly. As he was driven to the county jail, Howard made up his mind that he was going to snitch. He was going to tell officers everything he knew, and hopefully, they would go easy on him. Hopefully, they would look at his relatively clean record, one free from any drug charges, and give him the lightest sentence. Maybe he would even get no sentence at all. Howard then became the chief witness in the burgeoning federal crime. He had already agreed to plead guilty to conspiracy charges, and in exchange, the feds were going to give him two things. First, they had promised a minimum sentence when he could have gone away for the rest of his life, and second, he would be granted bail. Then, in April of 2002, on the first day of the trial, Kenneth Hart Adams pled guilty. And even though he never actually testified against the accused, Howard was released on $200,000 bond. He then gave the judge his word that he would report to federal authorities in his home state of Georgia and that he would return to New York for that fall for his own sentencing. Maybe he was honest when he made that promise, but soon he was already planning on how he was going to get away. Chapter 3 during his arrest and while he waited in prison for the trial of Kenneth Adams, Howard's second wife, Wilda, left him, with neither of the pair filing for divorce until later. Now single and broke, Howard tried to figure out a way to finance a life on the run, but he was quickly coming up short. He had never had that much money to begin with, and since his mother, his aunt, and his uncle had all already put their houses up as collateral to get Howard out on bond, they had nothing left for him to beg, borrow, or steal. That just left Howard's 73-year-old stepfather, Sam Thomas. Howard knew Sam wasn't just going to give him money, especially if it meant that Howard was going to run. So, Howard would just have to get Sam's money another way. Now, it's unknown if Howard's new and underage friends were involved, or if they even knew about what Howard had done, but what is known is that in the fall of 2002, Howard Hawk Willis murdered Sam Thomas. Bradley County, Tennessee early September 2002. Sam Thomas lived alone in his house on Old Lead Mine Valley Road in an extremely rural area. It was so rural, in fact, that it would be over a month before anyone even knew that Sam was missing. Howard quietly infiltrated his stepfather's home and located the old man. There were no words, no begging or shouting. Howard simply raised his gun and pulled the trigger. The easy part was now over. Howard dragged the limp form of his stepfather outside where, picking up an axe and hacksaw, he began to cut up the slowly stiffening body. As he worked, he placed the now much more manageable pieces in the trunk of his car before heading back into the house where he cleaned up every last drop of blood. Then, climbing back into his car, he drove Sam's body south to Walker County and up Lookout Mountain. Finding a spot he deemed acceptable, Howard dumped the pieces of Sam Thomas spreading them out over a small patch of ground. Then he simply left. It would be over a month before Sam Thomas was reported missing on October 7th. One week later, Sam's torso was found by hunters walking through the wilderness surrounding Lookout Mountain. Chapter 4 Howard continued to hang out with his underage friends and even used his newfound money in the form of credit cards stolen from Sam Thomas to buy them gifts as he worked his way to the next part of his plan. On the few occasions when Willis was seen in the company of the two youths, Adam and Samantha, multiple witnesses would state that the way Howard treated Samantha was less than appropriate. He seemed to have a habit of staring as well as getting too close, and it was pretty noticeable to everyone except for Adam who for some strange reason had developed a weird sort of hero worship for the middle-aged man. All of these strange feelings and suspicions would later be proven fruitful when photographs were found in Howard's possession that featured Samantha partially clothed and in sexually explicit poses. 
it appeared as if Howard, in his plans to escape, might not have wanted to go alone. Vicki Ryan worked as a veterinarian at the East Ridge Animal Hospital in Chattanooga, Tennessee. On September 25, 2002, a dog by the name of Doge was checked in for boarding. The owner, Samantha Krismer. Doge was never picked up. Miss Wilma Clay was Howard's mother's next-door neighbor. From April 2002 to September of that same year, she had, on multiple occasions, seen Howard, his daughter Kelly, as well as two other young adults who matched the descriptions of Adam and Samantha Krismer. After September, however, she never saw the young couple ever again. Then, on October 5th, Miss Clay went outside to smoke a cigarette and saw Howard, himself smoking a cigarette, standing beside his mother's red jeep. It appeared to be loaded down, full to the brim of what looked like personal belongings. She then finished her cigarette and headed back inside. October 4th. Patty Lemming, Samantha's mother, went to the Pizza Hut to pick up dinner for her family. While there, she was happy to see her daughter, who was there waiting herself, for a pizza Howard had ordered for their own dinner. She greeted her daughter, telling her she wished that she could see her more when Adam, her daughter's husband, came through the door and, ignoring her, took her daughter Sam by the arm and said, quote, Howard said, let's go, end quote. She never saw her daughter alive again. October 4th, 2002. Adam calls his mother and is obviously upset. As he talks, he begins to cry and tells his mom that he just wants to come home, but then he says, quote, I just have one more thing to do for Howard, end quote. His mother tried to talk to him, tried to find out what was wrong, but abruptly Adam hangs up the phone and all of Mrs. Krismer's attempts to call him back are in vain. Trying to call back one last time, she leaves a message, but Adam never calls her back. October 8th. 2002. Mrs. Krismer gets a call from a Bradley County detective who was looking for Adam. He apparently had been seen on camera at a local Walmart with Howard Hawk Willis, who was purchasing items with a credit card of a missing man named Sam Thomas. Realizing that Adam might be in more trouble than he was letting on, and because he still hadn't returned her calls, Mrs. Krismer decides to file a missing person report for her son. Three days later, on October 11th, Mrs. Krismer's phone rings. It was Howard Willis. Checking her caller ID, Mrs. Krismer sees that the number he was calling from was the same number she usually dialed to talk to Adam. She then asks Howard where Adam is and why he hasn't called her back. Without missing a beat, Howard says that the last time he had talked to Adam was at Adam's new living space, a trailer located in Rossville, Georgia. While holding Howard on the phone, Mrs. Krismer sent her husband to the next-door neighbors to call the Walker County, Georgia Sheriff's Office to inform them of the contact. While she continued to talk to Howard, Mrs. Krismer could clearly hear two women talking loudly in the background before Howard yelled for both of them to shut up. Other than that brief outburst, Howard remained, quote, cool as a cucumber, end quote. On October 8th, three days before he called Adam's mother, Howard had been interviewed by investigators from Bradley County and was specifically asked if he knew about the whereabouts of a missing couple. At that time, he told officers that he had last seen them four days earlier on October 4th. When he was then asked where they were, he claimed that he didn't know, but he thought maybe they could be in Georgia. Officers were then sent to Georgia to try and locate Samantha and Adam, but they were unsuccessful. Then, on October 11th, Howard Hawk Willis is arrested at the home of his Aunt Marie on federal charges of credit card fraud, a violation of his parole. He reiterated to authorities that the last time he saw the young married couple who went missing was on October 4th at their trailer on Mohawk Road in Rossville, Georgia. The search for them continued. October 11th, 2002. On the same day that Howard is arrested, 
A fisherman named Luther Earl Whitson observed what he believed was a mask floating in the water on Boone Lake in Washington County, Tennessee. The mask, upon closer inspection, was actually a severed human head. He immediately called 911. 24 hours later, another fisherman, Edward Brownlow Baker, was fishing in a tournament on Boone Lake when he found a hand floating in the water. Using a fishing net, he retrieved the hands before heading back into the dock where he met the officers after calling in what he had found. Later that same day, a crew of inmates participating in a service program found another hand on the shore of Boone Lake where it was photographed before being taken in as evidence. Investigators then began the seemingly impossible task of identifying the remains that were found in Boone Lake. They started by calling individuals who had recently reported someone missing, and that's when they learned from the Krismer family that their missing son Adam had a BB embedded in his cheek from a prior incident. The head found in the lake had a BB firmly embedded in its cheek. A DNA test was then ran and confirmed. They had found Adam, at least parts of him. Chapter 5. Officer Dwayne Cowan was the man who booked Howard Willis into the Washington County Jail in mid-October of 2002. He prepped the man for his stay in the jail as well as cataloged Howard's possessions, which included a pair of white tennis shoes. Howard was then shown to his bunk where he settled down, completely unaware that his every move, including his phone calls, were all being closely monitored by jailhouse officials. In one of these monitored calls, Betty, Howard's mother, begins to talk about a storage unit only to be sharply cut off by her son before he quickly changes the subject. Soon, a list of storage units in the area is made, and at one facility, officers learn that on October 10, 2002, Betty had rented Unit X-47 at the 24-hour self-storage facility in Johnson City, Tennessee. Upon arrival at the facility, officers approach the specific unit and notice maggots crawling out of the building through a crack where the door met the concrete floor. The smell of decay was also present. They immediately applied for a search warrant for the building. They also applied for two other search warrants. One at the home of Betty Willis, located at 104 Brentwood Drive, Johnson City, Tennessee, and another at her sister's home, Marie Holmes, who lived at 1324 Lowell Street, also in Johnson City. When officers are finally able to enter the storage unit, they would find two beige 50-gallon Rubbermaid containers that were covered by a blue tarp. Underneath the tarp, but on top of the containers, they find a hammer, a hatchet, and a pair of large scissors. The containers were also tied up with a length of yellow nylon rope. Also on the containers, five pop-top style air fresheners. Next to the containers were two large plastic fuel cans, each containing kerosene. Working slowly to make sure that each item was checked for fingerprints, they also began to catalog any staining or fibers. From the tarp, they were able to retrieve a clear print that was labeled and then set aside for evidence. It would later be matched to Howard Hawk Willis. Finally, when everything else had been cataloged, officers opened the storage containers. First was the smell, then the bugs. Reaching into the container, investigators pull out two throw rugs and then remove a black double XL jacket revealing a blanket wrapped something. The shape wasn't readily recognizable as a body the way it was wrapped in what looked like two separate blankets bound up tightly with black nylon rope, but because of the smell and the larvae, they already knew what it was. Both containers were then removed and sent to the county morgue where they could be unpacked in a more controlled environment. The container holding Adam's remains was emptied first. The throw rugs and the jacket that had been replaced at the scene were once again removed to reveal the tightly bound object in the center of the box. First they removed it, then they unfolded it. In order to make the boy's body fit inside of the container, Howard had not only removed the head and hands, but had also used a chainsaw to cut Adam's legs, but not all the way through. He had gone just deep enough to break through the bones and make it easier to fold the teen in half before placing him in the storage bin. Small bone fragments as well as fibers embedded into the skin show that it had been done after the boy had been wrapped up. Other fibers were found 
that were consistent with fibers removed from Adam's head that had been found not long before in Boone Lake. Adam's head had a bullet entry wound that started beneath the chin before traveling up through the pharynx and out through the base of the skull. Stippling around the wound showed that the shot was fired at close range within approximately two feet. Bruising around the entry wound showed that Adam had been alive when he had been shot. After Adam's remains had been gone through and all evidence collected, they next began to unpack the second container. First, they removed a pillow still inside its patterned pillowcase. Next, they removed two small rugs to reveal Samantha Krismer. She was nude and a gag had been placed around her mouth. Around each of her wrists ran a zip tie with a third zip tie binding them together behind her back. Each of her ankles also bore a zip tie, but they were not bound together. Discoloration and bruising underneath the zip ties showed that Samantha was still alive when she had been bound. She also had bruising to her right leg, her right breast, her right shoulder, as well as both of her feet. A talk screen then revealed that she had benzodiazepine in her system, indicating that she may have been drugged. The cause of death was two gunshot wounds to her head, with the bullet fragments still inside of her skull. Investigator Todd Davis was present at the storage unit during its search and was present when the victim's bodies were found. Later, he would canvass the local area and search to find where the container could have been purchased and when. Eventually, he would find the exact kind of container, a 50-gallon Rubbermaid, for sale at a Walmart in nearby Johnson City near Interstate 26. Store records showed that on October 7, 2002 at 3.51 p.m., someone purchased the container, a hatchet, and a pair of tennis shoes, the exact same brand and style, that were taken and inventoried from Howard the day of his arrest. During the search for where the containers might have come from, and more importantly, who had purchased them, other searches were also being conducted. At the home of Betty Willis, Howard's elderly mother, investigators found the house in, quote, major disarray, end quote. They also stated that, quote, there was a foul odor throughout the house and especially in the garage, end quote. There was also an enormous amount of debris on the carpet, including white paint stains and glass fragments. Flies and fly larvae were also present in the living room floor, with the exception of one area where the carpet held a large bleach spot. As investigators moved deeper into the house, they also noted that parts of the carpet in the dining room and hallway had been cut out and removed. Then, in a dresser drawer in one of the bedrooms, officers found a pillowcase with a yellow and tan floral pattern that was identical to the pillowcase found inside of the container with Samantha's body. Another officer searching another part of the home then found a length of black nylon rope, similar to the rope that had been tied around Adam's wrapped up torso. Another piece of fabric is then discovered, one that would eventually be matched to the jacket found wrapped around Adam's corpse. Finally, a pop-top air freshener, the same type and brand as the ones found in the storage unit, was discovered and taken into evidence. The search then moved outside to the surrounding property. Betty's red Jeep was found outside and, unlike the house, it was remarkably clean, though it still carried the smell of decay. Of note, when it was discovered, the carpet in the Jeep was still damp from having been cleaned. Then shouts as Lieutenant Steve Sheffrey, who had been walking the property, found a gun laying in the grass. The Risen A 7.655 pistol was just sitting there, unburied, right next to three unfired 32 caliber bullets. Inside Betty's garage, Officers also discovered a box of 32 caliber ammunition in a paper bag that had been placed on top of a dresser. The bullets located next to the gun were a match to the bullets in the garage. A later ballistics test would show that the Rizani fired the bullets that had killed Samantha Krismer. Cigarette butts were also taken into evidence and DNA testing revealed the DNA of Adam and Samantha Krismer. An electric chainsaw was then discovered and testing showed that there was presence of human blood and DNA on the chain, but because it had been left outside, the DNA was too degraded to get a positive sample. Chapter 6, October 15th, 2002. While Howard was still in jail on his federal warrant, he began to make phone calls to his mother where they would discuss the details of what was happening in the murder case of Adam and Samantha Krismer. 
They discussed the search of Betty's home along with her sister's home and how officers had impounded her red jeep as well as some clothing as it was all searched for evidence. Betty was increasingly becoming worried that she was going to soon be charged as an accessory to murder. She also told Howard about the discovered head and hands and how they were eventually identified as belonging to Adam. Betty at one point then says, quote, I've not taken anything over there to the storage shed. I haven't been back because I thought we were followed. End quote. Howard immediately responded to this by starting to tell his mother to shut up before she cut him off by saying, quote, They already know. End quote. Betty wasn't the only person who Howard talked to while in prison. He had apparently also been in contact with his second ex-wife, Wilda. She herself had been contacted by Betty, who relayed to her that Howard wanted her to come visit him in jail, and he had things that he wanted to tell her. Wilda then approached authorities about Howard's request and offered to work with them in an attempt to get Howard to confess to his crimes. Not only did Wilda want to help because Howard had killed a pair of teens, but Wilda also wanted to find out what happened to her uncle, Sam Thomas, who was also her ex-husband's stepfather. On the evening of October 15th, the same day Howard on a recorded line had told his mother to stop talking about the storage unit, Wilda, wearing a wire, sat on one side of a thick plexiglass divider while Howard sat on the other side. They tried to talk, tried to communicate with each other, but quickly became annoyed with how hard it was to hear each other through the glass. Howard then asked Wilda if she could come back the next day with a tape recorder, a notepad, and a pencil, all things he thought would make it easier for them to communicate. Wilda said she would try, but didn't know if they would let her see him again so soon. Howard then tells her to go and grab a, quote, $50 lawyer, end quote, who could pretend that she was his assistant. That way they could see each other in a private room, and once there, Howard could simply just ask the lawyer to leave, and then they could converse alone. The next day, on October 16th, 2002, Wilda, once again wearing a wire, first went and spent time with Betty Willis before heading back out to the jail to meet with Howard. Because she was working with law enforcement, she didn't have to bring a lawyer in order to get into the jail, but was instead provided a visitation room without any questions asked. Throughout their conversation, Howard repeatedly turned off the tape recorder before turning it back on, and at one point said that he, quote, blew the victim's brains out, end quote. He then confessed to cutting off Adam's head and hands and disposing of them near DeVault Bridge. He also confessed to placing the remainder of Adam's body, as well as Samantha's body, into a storage unit. He then claimed that he had shot Adam in self-defense, stating that Adam had done some drugs that made him crazy and that he had attacked Howard. He said that shortly after shooting Adam, he had also shot Samantha. After leaving the jail, Wilda continued to work with authorities, recording Howard any time he called her, even after he was moved from the South up to New York where he was held on his federal warrant. But, as time went by, Howard's story began to change. At one point, he even claimed that it was actually his 70-year-old mother who had been to blame, that she had been the one to actually shoot the teens, and he was just trying to help her out. During another phone call, he tried to blame the murders on Samantha's brother Daniel, while during another phone call, he claimed that the Mafia had also been involved. Then, on January 1, 2003, Wilda, ignoring the advice of law enforcement, made the trip up to New York to visit Howard in person. This time, without the blessing of law enforcement, she could not take in a recording device, and so their conversation went unrecorded. Afterwards, Wilda returned to Tennessee where she then told officers about her conversation with Howard and what he had asked her to do. The first item on her to-do list from Howard was to find the actual chainsaw he had used, one that he claimed Betty had thrown out of a car window. Wilda had received very specific directions where, starting from Chattanooga, she was to take I-75 North past Utuwala exit and take the exit at the gravel pull-off for runaway semi-trucks. Howard then said Wilda was to park next to the guardrail and walk until she could no longer see her car, then take a right into a ditch where she would discover the chainsaw. She was then supposed to take the chainsaw, clean it with gasoline, remove any fingerprints, and then take the tool to the home of Daniel Foster, Samantha's brother. 
Then she was to break into Daniel's house, steal some of his clothes and personal items before wrapping them around the chainsaw and placing it underneath his trailer. Her last step was to then call an anonymous tip, telling officers where they could find it. Wilda told every step to authorities who on January 3, 2003, accompanied her and took possession of the discarded chainsaw. During their search, Howard even called Wilda and over the recorded line, walked her to where the chainsaw was discovered and taken in as evidence. In a subsequent phone call, Howard told Wilda to find certain other objects he had thrown in the river so she could place them with the chainsaw underneath Daniel's home. The more Howard talked to Wilda, the deeper he dug his own grave. With more than enough evidence in hand, the trial of Howard Hawk Willis began. Chapter 7 During the trial, even more evidence came out against Howard and his mother, Betty. Brenda Holmes testified that within a few days after the defendant was arrested in October 2002, Betty came to the Holmes house and told her that Howard had told her to get some things, including a television, bolt cutters, a dolly, and a saw. Betty did not say why she needed those things. At the time, Mrs. Holmes just assumed that they were needed to clean up her house, which had been ransacked. While Betty was at the Holmes residence, she also was asked about some scratches that were on her arms, to which she responded that it was just a misunderstanding with her son Howard. She said he had a hot temper and sometimes he just lost control, but it was no big deal. Brenda Holmes did end up giving Betty the television, but she didn't have anything else on the list. Later, however, she did notice that two gasoline containers that had previously been sitting outside of her garage were missing. They were gasoline containers that matched the ones found at the storage unit. The defense then called on the testimony of Dr. Robert Allen, who was not only Betty's neighbor, but also her physician as well. He stated that on September 15, 2002, Betty was hospitalized after she exhibited psychotic behavior, paranoia, and anxiety. He also stated that he had been inside of Betty's house after she was hospitalized, only to find out that it had been vandalized. The refrigerator and other appliances had been overturned, the toilets in the house were broken, and there was graffiti painted all over the walls. There was also a maggot infestation and clumps of food that had been strewn about the house. The doctor would eventually write a letter of his findings to give to Betty's insurance company to support her claim of vandalism. Next, Dr. Watson Horzelski was brought in to testify for the state. In order to seek the death penalty, they had to first prove some aggravating circumstances, one of which was how long Samantha had been kept alive after her husband Adam had been murdered. If the state could just prove that there had been kidnapping involved with Samantha's murder, that she had been restrained after the death of her husband, it would be enough to trigger the possibility of the death penalty. Dr. Watson Horzleski then went on to describe to the jury the particular species of fly that was discovered at the scene before going into detail about the fly's life cycle. She then stated that she believed that the insect activity began before the bodies were placed in the containers and not after. She went on to describe Betty's home and how the same species of fly larvae were present in multiple areas throughout the house, especially in the carpet in the living room. Then she described how the fly activity and the maturation of the larvae led her to believe that Adam had been killed up to 36 hours before Samantha had. Quote, she based her conclusion on the fact that the flies on Adam's body had matured to the one to four day old pupae stage, but the flies on Samantha's body had matured only to the larvae feeding stage. End quote. This meant that Adam had been murdered between October 5th and October 8th, and that Samantha had died between October 7th and October 12th. To corroborate the doctor's findings, Dr. Arpad Vass was then called to the stand where he testified that his analysis of the tissue samples from the victim's liver and kidneys were consistent with the finding that Adam had died first. He then presented his time of death as being between October 4th and October 8th for Adam, with Samantha having died between the dates of October 6th and October 8th. Other witnesses were called both for the defense and prosecution before finally the jury was sent to deliberate. When they returned, they found the defendant, Howard Hawk Willis, guilty of first-degree premeditated murder of Adam Krismer, the first-degree premeditated murder of Samantha Krismer, and the felony murder of Samantha Krismer in perpetration of or attempt to perpetrate a kidnapping. For the families involved, it was finally over.
Both of the victim's mothers then gave impact statements in which they were able to tell the defendant how he had not only ruined their lives, but the lives of everyone who knew Adam and Samantha. Both mothers had held jobs before the death of their children that neither were able to perform anymore. They told of their love for their children and how the world would be a dimmer place without them. Howard was then sentenced to death twice, once for each of his teenage victims. In October of 2010, eight years after her son was murdered, Teresa Christmer Lynch, Adam's mother, finally took possession of her son's body when she was given his ashes on a Saturday in Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. Samantha's body had been returned to her family relatively shortly after she was found, but Adam's remains were kept as evidence. As she held her son for the first time in over eight years, she began to sing Adam's favorite song, Angel from Montgomery. A memorial service was later held and attended by Adam's friends from Ridgeland High School. Sharon Gladden, a mother of one of Adam's friends, Jonathan Gladden, said, quote, Jonathan has a speech impediment, and Adam was one of the only people that didn't tease him, end quote. She would go on to say that Jonathan would never forget Adam. Howard Hawk Willis is still in prison on death row in Tennessee. He's still fighting to have his death penalty overturned. This has been another episode of Almost Fiction, a podcast where we try to imagine what it was like in the moments where some of the worst crimes occurred. Thank you so much for all of your support. If you love Almost Fiction but don't like the ads, for only $5 a month you can get Almost Fiction early and ad-free. You will also get access to Almost Fiction Plus, a bonus show for our supporters. So if you want to support the show plus get access to our bonus show, head on over to almostfiction.supercast.com. That's almostfiction.supercast.com. Times are tough, and if money is too tight, it's just as important for us if you can rate the show and leave a review. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to almostfictionpod at gmail.com. That's almostfictionpod at gmail.com. Almost Fiction also has a Facebook group, so head on over there to see the exclusive posters that accompany each episode as well as to keep up with everything Almost Fiction related. Once again, thank you for all you do. And as always, I'm Chase Ellerman, and this is Almost Fiction.